Well, good evening, and welcome to CAF Warbird Tube, a show where we talk about warbirds, history, World War II, flying, and much more. The show is supported by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. This nonprofit membership organization has preserved and flown historic aircraft for more than 65 years. CAF's mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. And you can support the uh, CAF through donations, membership, and by volunteering your time and talents. Visit commemorativeairforce.org for more information. I'm your host, Steve Bus, and we'd like to welcome everybody watching tonight, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, and those of you watching on GoToMeeting. If you would do us a favor, uh, just take a second to hit that like, share, and subscribe, and follow us button, depending on what platform you're on. But it'll help uh, generate the uh, algorithms and also help keep you informed with uh, all the upcoming episodes we have of Warbird 2. Now, this episode, we're going to explore a largely unknown piece of history about U.S. citizens who went to Canada before the United States was involved in World War II to join the Royal Canadian Air Force and fly for the RCAF. All right, now if you have any questions for our guest while we're uh, talking tonight, just put them in the chat box and we'll do our best to address them. And joining us right now from Alberta, Canada, Carl Karjigard. Carl, and I think I messed up your name, but uh, you've got a, a great story for us anyway, right? Well, Yes, Steve, and uh, um, you can call me anything you want. Uh, our, our common denominator is aircraft and the uh, courageous airmen that flew them in combat. And uh, your audience, you're going to be you're going to be stunned by this story about these eight thousand eight hundred Americans in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Well, Carl, before we get into that, just uh, give folks a little uh, brief update on, on you and, and uh, your involvement, uh, not only in this project, but in uh, several other things that are going on uh, north of the border, as it were. Right. Well, I've always been uh, in love with aircraft. And uh, uh, as I moved up into my teens, I went to flying college. Uh, I got my all my licenses. I was a bush pilot in the Northwest Territories of Canada for two years on Twin Otters, uh, served with Air Canada for 37 years and retired off the, the Boeing 767 uh, 10 years ago. And uh, as I transitioned to uh, retirement, I joined the Bomber Command Museum of Canada in Nanton, Alberta. We're a national memorial museum and um, I was trained to fly by a Battle of Britain Spitfire pilot, and I got my twin engine rating from a Canadian that flew on the Dam Buster raid in 1943, Ken Brown. So, uh, you know, I've been raised on the good old aircraft and the greatest generation in World War II. Uh, what a quantum leap it was from 1939 to 1945 in aviation. And the sacrifice was so huge, I just had to, as I transitioned to retirement, I would go full bore on honoring my heroes. So here I am in the middle of this, and uh, we're going to tell a story today and with some big discoveries for your viewers. Well, good. Uh, those of us in the United States often uh, frame World War II as starting on December 7th, 1941. But really, World War II started uh, in 1939 in September. Uh, but in, and even in uh, Southeast Asia and China, it was going on even before that. So the, the world was in conflict before the United States entered the war. But tell us a little bit about the uh, the state of, of mind in, in Canada uh, before the U.S. Uh, entered the war. What, what were what was it like in Canada at that time? Well, OK, so. Uh, Germany and uh, England, Britain went to war in 1939. Canada was part of the British Commonwealth. And so we said, we're in all the way with you, England, and we will do whatever is required to support this uh, war effort. And so we geared up and we said, we will use our broad prairies, our clearer skies without ammunition flying around. And we will train airmen, give them the trades, and we will send them to you in England. And that would be the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Now, remember, Roosevelt said that the Americans 
uh, during World War II were the arsenal of democracy. Canada was the aerodrome of democracy. We had scores of airfields across Canada training airmen as navigators, pilots, air gunners. We trained, we were number one in the world in the British Commonwealth. Canada trained 132,000 airmen. So any bomber that left England to go attack Germany, there was at least one airman on every bomber that had been trained in Canada to get their trade. We trained the Australians in Canada. We trained the Brits in Canada. And lo and behold, before Pearl Harbor, two years before Pearl Harbor, American lads came up and said, we're going to fight starting now. And so this is uh, that evolvement into World War II includes those 8,800 plus Americans who joined us and over 850 Americans from 48 states were killed in action. So that's the intro to this big context of Americans fighting for Canada. Well, this slide is uh, the uh, one of the aircraft that they used to uh, do their primary training in, the uh, Fleet Finch, and uh, very important to the training command, but also uh, it, it has a, a tie back to the commemorative Air Force and uh, some of the restoration efforts that are going on today. So we've, we've, we're seeing history come full circle again. Well, that's right. And, you know, I'm thinking about it and I'm looking at these uh, cute little Fleet Finches, which are your primary trainer in Canada. And at the start of the war, 1939, 40, and 41, this was the main trainer of all the guys that were training in Canada. And isn't it peculiar that a the oldest aircraft in the commemorative Air Force fleet, which is a big fleet, the oldest aircraft, the one that ties our two nations together, is a Royal Canadian Air Force. Fleet Finch 4456 that you have at uh, the Comanche Peak Wing in Texas, Granbury, Texas. So here's this cute little buggity buggity machine with the Kinner. And we all know how smoothly Kinners run. <laughs> but uh, this Fleet Finch is, it's huge because guess what? Every American that became a pilot in the Royal Canadian Air Force, they trained on fleet finches. And you, we're going to get to it, Steve. You would not believe how many stunning World War II aces cut their teeth, started out on the fleet finch. There's another one uh, that's taken at some of the airfields. Canada had over 100 airfields across from coast to coast. And of course, you've got primary training, uh, secondary training, and then your twin engine training. And so the Fleet Finch was uh, quite a big part of that. They did transition later on in the war to the Tiger Moth uh, primary trainer and also the PT-26, which in Canada, we don't call it that, we call it the Cornell. So, but, and then after primary, they would go to the T6, which in Canada, we didn't call the T6, we called it the Harvard. So th this is a uh, part of the grand training scheme as we move our airmen towards combat. So as a, a primary trainer, a very uh, light aircraft, very simple, easy to fly. Uh, I, I noticed the uh, the canopy on there uh, for uh, some of the, the colder weather conditions uh, in Canada. Yes, that's right. It's probably even colder than Wisconsin, although just by a touch. <laughs> but for those guys that are living in the, the balmy Texas weather, uh, Canada has put canopies on a lot of their aircraft because they would be training at minus 20 degrees uh, flight training. Tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, specifications on, on the airplane, just in, in general, uh, 
the specs on it. You said it was Kinner engine. Uh, obviously, uh, not not a lot of horsepower. No, I I believe it was a, a one twenty five horsepower Kinner. There was three or four different kinds of Kinners, and I think the all up weight, including uh, flight crew, was two thousand two hundred pounds. And uh, I think top speed, maybe coming downhill a little bit, was like about 105, 110 miles an hour. But that wasn't why the airplane was there. It was to give them the rudiments of flying. And uh, uh, the Kinner could take punishment too. So uh, if you rounded out where you thought the runway was, and it was actually four feet below you, uh, I've never done that myself, I lie. Okay, <laughs> so the, the thing is, is it was a real tough airframe and it, it could take uh, the, uh, the mistakes of the uh, rookie pilots uh, quite well. And this, this is a uh, very significant, in fact, I have that right here and I bought that on eBay. This is war surplus. This is the shoulder patches worn on the shoulder by the Americans in the Royal Canadian Air Force. So they felt that because there were so many Americans in the Royal Canadian Air Force, they should be allowed and be able to spotlight <clears throat> their nationality. So those young lads from the States, when they were, uh, qualified and had their wings, they were uh, allowed to wear these shoulder patches, which signified um, their willingness to fight for Canada. So the, the 8,000 plus uh, Americans that, that crossed the border to join the, the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force, how did they, how did they know about it? How did they, was there a recruiting effort or was it just a feeling in this country that I want to do something? Uh, my country's not in the war yet, uh, but I want to be a part of this. And, 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 and in America, we're coming off the Great Depression too, so jobs are, are, are scarce. But was there a recruiting effort um, or did, did people just kind of go word of mouth? No, no, it was, uh, it was well organized, but it was uh, it kind of like it, <clears throat> it was it was hiding, but it wasn't hiding. And what it was is because of the Americans' neutrality before Pearl Harbor. Um, okay, I've got to back up a little bit. Starting in 39, the Canadians said, we need thousands and thousands of air crew. Uh, and that would include the Americans. And Billy Bishop, the World War I Canadian ace that shot down 72 aircraft, he was a senior officer in the Royal Canadian Air Force when World War II started. And he had enough contacts in the USA, that is political, uh, recruiting, uh, networking, that he said, you know, we can ask these young American men that would like to become airmen, we can recruit them and they could become part of the Royal Canadian Air Force. So they set up recruiting offices in Texas, in uh, New York, in Los Angeles, in uh, Seattle. They, they set up all these recruiting offices and after vetting and qualifying, these young airmen from the United States were accepted into the Royal Canadian Air Force. And uh, uh, so that was called the Clayton Knight Committee. And they're the ones that set up the recruiting network across the USA. But it was Billy Bishop and I know a guy. You know, he, he knew enough guys that he could set up this network. And so that's how it came to be that these young airmen from, even from Alabama or wherever, uh, Texas, they just came. And you gotta remember if for every, airmen killed in action, an American airman in the Canadian Air Force, 10 more joined and survived. It's a 10 to one ratio. So out of the 8,864 Americans that joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, 850 plus were killed in action. And we have all their names at my museum, their hometowns, the aircraft they were on, all of their crash investigations, we've got them all. 
and they're honored on our memorial wall where th there's over 10,000 names inscribed on our memorial wall and the Americans are there, their names killed in action with our Canadian lads. And uh, because we didn't mention it at the top of the show, but uh, where is uh, the museum? The museum is uh, in Western Canada, uh, one hour south of Calgary, Alberta. And uh, we're right on the main highway to Montana. And uh, we have a running Lancaster. We have a national memorial to, with uh, 10,000 names engraved, a 30,000 square foot uh, main hangar. And uh, we're rebuilding and rejuvenating aircraft uh, in our rebuild shop. So uh, we're medium sized, but with a strong spirit. There you go. And uh, so you mentioned the Lancaster, but uh, this uh, airplane that we're looking at now, the Halifax, really uh, played a very important role uh, with the uh, Canadian Air Force. That's right. And a lot of folks in the States will think, well, they're Canada and, and the British guys, they flew Lancasters. That's all we know. And what you need to know is the British flew the Lancasters in their squadrons, but the Canadians were given the heavy bomber four engine bomber called the Halifax made in England. And that's what the Canadians flew 71% of the time. The Canadian in the Royal Canadian Air Force did not fly the Lancaster very much, only 20%. So if you could only pick one aircraft, a heavy bomber that would be symbolic of Canada's contribution to Bomber Command and uh, rattling Hitler's cage in Germany, it would be the Halifax. So I learned that, thank goodness, I learned that 15 or 20 years ago, and the Halifax has become my primary goal, my primary aircraft. And uh, this is a beautiful picture, I like this. This shows you what it takes to run a heavy bomber. The Amer uh, Canadians had only seven air crew running the Halifax bomber. All the rest are support crew and ground crew. And uh, uh, Steve, did you know that Canada developed a secret weapon, a vengeance weapon in the Royal Canadian Air Force? And it was delivered to Berlin by a Canadian Halifax. You know what it was? Well, what is that? There was a navigator named Bill Riom, and he won a Norton 1920s motorcycle in a card game at the bomber base. And one night he was cruising out there on the, the British lanes with 100 octane fuel in his 1920s motorcycle, and it freezed up solid. And here's Bill thinking that he's going to have beautiful transport, which nobody else had. For the, for the coming months, you know, he'd be totally independent with his motorcycle. He was so ticked off that he couldn't salvage, save, or do anything with his motorcycle that he talked to the armorers that were loading up the Halifax the next night, and they loaded the, the dead Norton motorcycle up in the bomb bay, and they threw it out over Berlin. So that is Canada's Royal Canadian Air Force vengeance weapon. Take that, at all. <laughs> so well, that's, a, that's a great story. I know it was told to me by a buddy of Bill Riom, who okay. was on the same bomber crew. So I've hel held on to that forever because Canada has to have a vengeance weapon, and it was Norton is in there somewhere. There you go. So as we're looking at the the Halifax, uh, let's put in context the uh, the I guess the size and the sp and the specs on that airplane. That's I think you said there's a 103 foot wingspan. So you know a B-17 is about 107. So right. it's roughly the same uh, wingspan. Yes, that's right. Uh, but I would say if you the Halifax cockpit window was 22 feet off the ground. Uh, it, it was a big airplane. And now there were the early Halifaxes with Merlin engines, and each engine had 1,400 horsepower in the Merlin. And later on, they said, we need more horsepower 
to improve the performance. And this is one of those improved Halifaxes. It's got in there Bristol Hercules 14 cylinder radials. I would say the American equivalent is an R2600. It's got the equivalent of four R2600s in there and it was putting out 1,650 horsepower. So you can see this improved version of the Halifax, which went on to do great things in combat, it had 1,000 more horsepower per airframe than the earlier Halifaxes. So that's why I've focused on this radio powered Halifax. And uh, it, it was a great performer. Uh, it's what the Canadians and the Americans in the Royal Canadian Air Force, it's what they flew the most. And I'll just say one more thing. As far as I'm concerned, because of these 8,800 Americans in the Royal Canadian Air Force, there are four heavy bombers that Americans flew the most in World War II. The first one is the B-17. The second one's the B-24. The third one is the B-29. And the fourth one is the Halifax, because the most airmen that sacrificed their lives in bombers in the Royal Canadian Air Force, those American lads, they were flying the Halifax. So America, you have four heavy bombers that you need to remember. That's awesome. Yeah, That's a familiar the looking chap there on the right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and I met him twice. That's Big Joe McCarthy. And Big Joe was from New York State. And he came up to the in the Royal Canadian Air Force. And guess what he flew in primary training? <laughs> the Finch. Finch. I, I don't know how you would get Big Joe into yeah. a fleet Finch. I know how you could do it in two words, very carefully. But Joe was like about 6'5", 2", 240 or 230 or something like that. Anyways, Big Joe went on to become a Lancaster pilot and he was the only American on the Dam Buster raid, that 1943 raid that blew open the German dams in Germany uh, and a super special raid. And this is taken just a few days after they blew open the dams with their Lancasters. And here's the King of England uh, meeting Big Joe, and if you look on, uh, it's kind of hard to see, I guess, maybe, but if you look on the shoulder patch of Big Joe, right there, yeah, thanks for the mouse, that's a good idea, Steve, that's the mouse there circling the shoulder patch, that is Canada, USA, so uh, the king, and you can see the queen mother behind, and she, she met all of the dam busters that were on that raid. So I wanted to show that big Joe from the Royal Canadian Air Force. Well, and that, that just it ties into uh, a, a little comment that uh, Daniel Peters, one of our, our uh, uh, viewers tonight, just dropped in. It says uh, uh, his grandfather was an American RCAF pilot on the 419th Muth Squadron. Uh, and he did fly Lancasters, and he was just asking if that was, it was rare for Americans to fly Lancasters. Obviously, on the Dam Buster raid, they were flying Lancasters, but uh, I would imagine as the war went on, you kind of got what you what you got, whatever was ready to go. Yes, okay, well, I'll just make a, a, a delineation here, is <clears throat> many of the Royal Canadian Air Force air crew were seconded to British RAF squadrons. They didn't not 100% of them went to a Canadian squadron. So you could have a guy like Big Joe, RCAF, he ended up in a British squadron and flew Lancasters. And, but remember I said only 20% of Royal Canadian Air Force combat was flown in the Lancaster. 71% over three times as much was flown in the Halifax. Joe is one of those uh, that went uh, to the British squadrons. And uh, probably uh, something similar for uh, for Daniel's grandfather as well. Uh, do you have any recollection, and I'm just throwing this at you, the, the uh, 419th Moose Squadron, does that ring any bells for you? Yes, yes, uh, 419, 
Uh, they flew almost exclusively Lancasters. They're part of that 20% that of the Royal Canadian Air Force that flew Lancasters. They were out of flying out of Yorkshire, England to the north. <clears throat> and uh, so um, they flew, uh, they're one of the few squadrons that flew mainly Lancasters. So that is correct. But for every, every flight done in the Lancaster in the Royal Canadian Air Force, there were three or four Halifax flights flown at the same time. So we need to put it in perspective. And then of course, if you, if you wanna be able to uh, listen to a guy drone on about Halifaxes, uh, he's on your screen right now, okay? <laughs> And thank you, Daniel, for uh, for jumping in and, and dropping that comment in for us. A again, if you have questions or comments or whatever, just uh, put them in the chat box and we'll, we'll try to work them into the presentation. Uh, another uh, medal uh, uh, award here, along, and this is Eisenhower making this award. Sure. Yes, this is uh, Ike, and he's uh, pinning uh, Distinguished Service Cross uh, awards uh, to uh, Salvatore Gentile and Don Blakesley, the guy that's standing in the clear. And uh, we found this out during our investigation of your Fleet Finch down in Granbury, Texas, is, um, I gotta explain this. The Royal Canadian Air Force fighter pilots that went to England in 19, late 42, 43, the United States Army Air Force said, where the heck can we get a whole bunch of personnel in a hurry to fill our combat airplanes? Oh, wait a minute. There's several thousand Americans in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Let's make an appeal, invite them to come over. And of the 8,800 Americans in the Royal Canadian Air Force, about 3,800 of them transferred over to the United States Army Air Force in 1942-43. These guys, these Americans in the RCAF that transferred, they were already combat veterans. They'd already shot down enemy aircraft or done 20 or 30 bombing missions. And so, um, you know, all of this helped the United States Army Air Force. How much did they help? Here's what we found out is, these two gentlemen here are fighter aces in the fourth fighter group of the 8th Air Force, Gentile and Blakesley. They're both RCAF fighter pilots that came over to the Army Air Force. They shot down 15, 20 aircraft each. And so we found out the top six aces of the 4th Fighter Group, which is an elite in the United States Army Air Force, the top six aces of the fourth fighter group are RCAF American fighter pilots. So we're gonna show the list a little later yeah. on. <clears throat> but but, but I also, to, yeah. Go ahead. go ahead, finish up. Well, I just wanted to accent that. Now, look at this image here, folks. That's on, where I was going. <laughs> yeah, the, on the, looking at yeah that's good thanks steve i don't want to get left from right screwed up that pilots can do that okay and uh so uh just put the mouse there again on the on the wings uh, on blakesley and you see that wing that on the mouse there that is a royal canadian air force pilots wings and any rcaf american who was a fighter pilot that went over to the united states army air force he was allowed to wear his Royal Canadian Air Force pilot wings with pride because he knew where he had come from. So both Blakesley and Gentile have the, that's the American pilot's wings. And so they're the only pilots in the United States Army Air Force that would have two sets of wings on their tunic uh, breast pockets. So that's a, that's a finesse item. And here's, remember I said six of those aces. So the first two, Gentile and Blakesley. Now here we have on your screen's left, Jim Goodson. And on our right is Ralph Hoffer. 
and they shot down 15 or 20 airplanes and guess where they just happened to get trained on fleet benches? Uh, I, am I gonna break this record? Royal Canadian Air Force. So, and there's, there's two more, uh, but we don't have photos of them. But I wanted to, if anybody, any folks there that say fleet finches and big deal, what did this have to do with the United States Army Air Force? And you say, this is the airplane that trained the top six aces of the United States Army Eight Air, Army Air Force of the Fourth Fighter Group. So it's just uh, we're building something up here. How are we doing on time, Steve? I know we got. Oh, we're we're fine. We're good. Okay, good, good. And uh, so, folks, this is thank you, Leah Block at commemorative air force headquarters she did what we always wanted to have is okay 8864 rcaf americans were up here in canada and flying out of england and 850 of these lads were killed in action we're finding more all the time but we've got a major handle on the numbers 850 were killed in action in the royal canadian air force and they were from 48 states and two of them killed in action were from hawaii so leah built this map and look at this folks if you could zoom in and uh you know you can get this this image is in the uh an expanded view in the dispatch commemorative Air Force magazine. So you got to have a look on every state in the union. It gives you the number of RCAF Americans from that state killed in action. And if you look on the uh, on your left, folks, you see California, 66 Americans from California were killed in action in the Royal Canadian Air Force. But that's not the big one. The big one is New York State, and it's kind of kind of cluttered over there, New York State. 120 young patriots uh, from New York State were killed in action in the Royal Canadian Air Force. So these guys are your heroes now. They were, for the past 15 years after we discovered this, these guys are my heroes. And so, we're trying to uh, make sure that we uh, remember their sacrifice and try to spotlight them. How did you how did you find out find these numbers? And obviously, there are names that go go behind the, these numbers as well, as you said, they're on their memorial wall. But how did you go about researching and, and discovering these numbers? Well, um, we have a, a kind of a Bible. It's called they shall grow not old it's the royal canadian air force great great big huge volume on the 16,000 airmen killed in world war ii <clears throat> that were in the royal canadian air force this this uh, book is pretty big well it's it's bigger than my head steve okay and so but uh this book on every page when you go through these 500 pages of all these airmen there's a mini bio history on each of these 16,000 airmen. On every page in this book, you will see a young man from the USA in the Royal Canadian Air Force killed in action. And so we started building up a master database in uh, uh, 2005, believe it or not. And we've been adding since then. And so we've got over 850 now Americans uh, that uh, fell in combat uh, in World War II flying with the Canadians. So that's, that's how we were able to do that, is we've correlated everything together and set up a master list. And it's on our website here at the Bomber Command Museum of Canada. So you can go there and you can see the RCAF Americans and uh, they're also on, uh, inscribed on our wall. And okay, so Steve, I wanted Steve to understand, well, 
big deal has nothing to do with Wisconsin. And so all you EAA types, look at this, 12 young airmen killed in action from Wisconsin. And there's their names. This is all from our, our master list. There's all the names of the young men and the aircraft type and the hometown. We've got a lot more data on these guys. We've got their complete RCAF files with 30 or 40 pages on each airman. But okay, so Wisconsin, now I've got Steve's attention. So now he, he can say, yeah, I gotta, I gotta do this, I gotta help. So, but okay, let's go to you folks down in Texas and say, well, yeah, I've been to Canada once in a while. But okay, so here is in Texas, 37 young airmen killed in action from the state of Texas. And uh, we, there is one, and I hope that uh, the Comanche Peak guys have already picked up on this. There is one American from Texas killed in action from Granbury, Texas, Mr. R.C. Jordan. And lo and behold, what airplane was he flying in combat when he was kicking Adolf's rear end? Is that was the Halifax. So um, I hope that the uh, Comanche Peak guys can hold on to this when they go to air shows and tell people about this. And uh, what do we know about Mr. Jordan? Is that the next one? Uh, do we have uh, Mr. There he is. Mr. Jordan from, I think it's Robert Jordan. I got names swimming around my head here. So I think it's Robert Jordan from Granbury, Texas. And you see folks, the wings on his breast pocket, that is uh, O for observer. And observer in British terminology, if you would like to use proper English, that means navigator. So observers were navigators and Robert Jordan learned his trade in the Royal Canadian Air Force and then was uh, flying uh, on the Halifax, unfortunately, when he uh, was killed in action. But how can you strike home? Folks, every single state, I don't care what state you're in the states, we've got maybe you might only have one or two guys killed in action, but you got to have a look at our master list and then you'll say, uh, wow, that touches home. And uh, here's my favorite one, Steve. This is the last Hanley Page Halifax ever built in World War II. Uh, this is taken at Leavesden, UK. And the pilot accepted the Halifax, the last one off the assembly line. And uh, this is the grand hurrah. And so after he took off, he says, um, I think I better dust these folks off. So he came back and he let her rip coming across the uh, British airfield. And you can see the wingtip is probably only 20 feet off the ground. And uh, the, you should see the video of this. This is so cool. He goes by and I think the wingtip even comes down lower to the ground. And then he goes arcing by and he goes screaming up over the top of the giant hangar at the end of the airfield. And that's the, the goodbye swan song for the Halifax. And after the war, the Canadians took all their Lancasters home to Canada from England. And guess what they left behind to be cut up? All their combat Halifaxes. So I've spent uh, my life over the past 20, 25 years recovering Halifaxes from underwater all over the world. So we're, I'm on my third Halifax recovery and you will see in the dispatch magazine, you will see the focus on the Halifax and the number four, four most important bom heavy bomber in American history. 
That's true. We are just touching on uh, basically the the surface of the uh, the Royal Canadian uh, Air Force Americans. Uh, as you mentioned, the dispatch is completely uh, dedicated to the uh, RCAF uh, Americans and also the Fleet Finch, uh, but it, it goes into much greater detail. Uh, the uh, electronic version is out already. Uh, I see Leah has posted a, a link to it on, on Facebook. I'm sure she'll do it on, on YouTube and, and, and that as well. So if you haven't read it yet, it's out there. And then, of course, the printed version will be coming a little bit later on this month. But it, it really goes into more depth than, than what we have time uh, to do uh, tonight. But uh, one of the things that, uh, along with uh, recovering Halifaxes, but one of the things that, that you're driving for is, uh, as we go back to this, this map, is really to try to raise the uh, awareness in this country of the Americans who, who crossed the border for, with very good intentions, very heroic intentions, to uh, help support the war effort. Uh, before the United States was was ever in that, and and that is the uh, drive to see if we can't uh, have them recognized with the uh, Congressional Gold Medal. Sure, the Congressional Gold Medal. And uh, okay, Steve, there's something important in all of this. Is okay, and I'll back up. I'm a student of history. They asked Werner von Braun, "What was the most uh, toughest thing about putting a man on the moon?" Do you know what his answer was? It was finding the will to put the man on the moon. It wasn't the technology. It wasn't uh, how much fuel do we need? Uh, how big are our rockets? It was finding the will to do that. And that's what was the most difficult thing. So with this Congressional Gold Medal, if we got everybody on the commemorative Air Force team, the EAA team, if we got everybody, if you're saying, holy smokes, I didn't know that, 8,800 of our boys were up there fighting even before Pearl Harbor. If, it, let's put it in context. And uh, Steve, you've got a slide here of the, the wartime groups that have received the Congressional Gold Medal. And okay, so, and folks, these guys, dynamite, dynamite airmen and veterans. We've got the uh, Doolittle Raiders have received the Congressional Gold Medal for their raid on Tokyo. That's one raid with one squadron, right? Okay, they got the Congressional Gold Medal. And I would say probably you had maybe 500 guys with the Doolittle Raiders that qualified for the Congressional Gold Medal. And then uh, let's move to the left. There's the WASPs, the, the uh, beautiful ladies that were flying the aircraft during World War II and supporting the Air Forces. Uh, you've got the uh, Code Talkers, the, the Wind Talkers. They received the Congressional Gold Medal for Excellence in Combat doing something special. And then of course our Tuskegee Airmen, and uh, we all know the story of those guys that uh, prevailed in World War II and became some of the best combat pilots uh, America produced. So here's these four groups received the Congressional Gold Medal. Great, love it. Now, if Carl said to you, well, you know there was 8,800 Americans flew in combat or flew aircraft up in Canada during World War II. If these groups, these special, special groups have received the Congressional Gold Medal, I think we have a solution for what should be a special award for these 8,800 young lads that were flying under the maple leaf and 850 unfortunately were killed in action but that puts it in perspective so Werner already told us what it is we got to do we have to find the will to do this and let me add on to something there now is 2022 the 100th birthday of the Royal Canadian Air Force is in 2024 what a beautiful thing that would be to bring our two nations together at that high point of history 
for America and for Canada in 2024. And imagine that it all started with a nice little yellow biplane in Granbury, Texas. It is amazing. And uh, this isn't something that's necessarily starting from scratch. I mean, it, uh, you've already got a little bit of momentum going. Uh, Tim Ryan, congressman from Ohio, is already interested in, in starting to put this forward. And uh, well, the, I, I guess the bill, maybe... The bill, the, sorry, Steve, the bill is already in Congress. Okay. It's just that the congressman and the senators haven't joined yet to support this bill. We've got, I think, two or three congressmen and uh, two, one or two senators. Uh, but remember that map that shows every state lost American lads in the Royal Canadian Air Force? So there, you've come up with a great idea, Steve, is here's a page that shows you how to get a hold of, locate, and light a fire under your congressman or your senator. And the commander of the RCAF, uh, Lieutenant General Al Meinsinger, he loves this project. He thinks that this is what we got to do. So it's already part of the 100th birthday celebrations in Canada. But I have a question. What are you guys in the States going to do? You're going to let it lie or are you going to go? So I hope I, I don't don't be offended, uh, Steve. I, I hope I haven't offended a bunch of people. But what I'm getting at is we got to do this because these guys, freedom is not free. Somebody paid for us. And if it's an American flying a Canadian Halifax, so be it. But we got to do what we got to do. And yeah, we're we've got the. Uh... We've got the ammunition right here. This uh, this particular website. There are several websites that you can go to to find out who your your representatives are. But uh, congress.gov will, will give you that. Give their phone numbers, email addresses, or you can write. It doesn't matter. But I think it all goes back to the map that you had uh, you and and Leah had put together when it shows that every every state in the union uh, had skin in the game. There was there were there were people who were flying and as you said for every one who was killed in combat there were probably 10 more from that state uh who crossed the border and, and joined the uh, rcaf so it's it's not something that's just a new york or a california or texas or wisconsin it is across the country and and i think it, just being able to point that out just to be able to say to your, your senator or congressman hey there were 125 people in the state of new york um who were killed in action flying for the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. There were probably, you know, 10, 10 times more that were that actually uh, served before the United States was in World War II. There's a precedent for recognizing outstanding uh, acts in, in, in combat and in, in, in World War II. And this would be, this should be a, a really a no brainer for, uh, for any of our representatives to, to get behind the bill and say, yes, let's, let's pass that and let's, uh, let's get this done in time for the uh, 100th anniversary in 2024. Sure. And um, now, Steve, I don't know, Did there is a photograph of Tom Withers, and that was on the original agenda. Uh, do we still have it? OK, so folks, I want to read you. This is Tom Withers from Roseland, Virginia, and he was killed in action as an air gunner on a Halifax bomber in 1943. But he was in third year university when he went to Canada and received his trade as air gunner. And unfortunately he was killed, but uh, I found all the letters that he wrote to home to Virginia. So I'd like to read you this and just so that you can digest the words. And um, so Tom Withers, Jr. from Roseland, Virginia, he says, I hope you do not worry about me and Henry too much. We are doing the only possible thing that we can do, the thing we should do. We are both, I believe, satisfied. You and dad have made our lives full ones by the very freedom that we have been taught to use in enjoying life. Now we have a more serious job to do, that of preserving this freedom. 
Tom Withers, Royal Canadian Air Force. So, uh, you know, that, that sums it up in a nutshell, and there's 8,800 stories like that. There certainly are. And uh, earlier in the, in the program, you mentioned the, uh, the uh, fourth uh, fighter group. And here's the actual uh, stats from that group. And these, again, were all uh, trained uh, in the, they started out in the Fleet Finch and trained with the Royal Canadian Air Force and became, you know, part of the, the, the initial backbone of the uh, Army Air Corps when the United States entered the war in 1941. Yeah. And so any, anybody that's going to start moving his lips without thinking is going to say, well, the Royal Canadian Air Force doesn't have n nothing to do with the 4th Fighter Group. And then you have to look at, there's Gentilly, uh, John Godfrey, Dwayne Beeson, James Goodson, Ralph Hoffer, Don Blakesley. They're all Royal Canadian Air Force aces that became United States Army Air Force aces because they transferred over. Talk about putting a goal scorer on your hockey team. These guys were all stars when they showed up. So, you know, I just, I think that we do have a, a wonderful common denominator, uh, a plural, which is our wonderful fleet finch of the commemorative Air Force, our airmen, our love of freedom, between the two countries. So uh, there's more in common between our two nations than uh, people know. And now they know even more. That's right. Uh, one of our viewers uh, just uh, popped in with a question. Did the uh, RCAF work with the US Air Force on any big missions once the United States was uh, in the fight? Yes, Anything okay. You know of? Yes, okay, so you had the 8th Air Force Bomber Command and Royal Air Force Bomber Command. And it, when they had their major meetings of the high command of both, if they decided that they want to pound a German target or city or factory, a certain target, the Americans would go in by day with their B-17s and their Liberators and the, uh, the Royal Air Force with their Halifaxes and Lancasters would go in at night. The Americans did the daylight raids on a certain target and the Brits and the Canadians and the Australians, whoever, would come in at night. So it was a double whammy. So yes, there was a lot of collaboration. And you know, it's like a bombing raid or a bomb load from a bomber is a sledgehammer blow. And did you have you ever seen video of the Berlin Wall coming down? Did you know how they took down the Berlin Wall? One sledgehammer at a time. So, you know, uh, Bomber Command, whether Army Air Force or Royal Air Force, Royal Canadian Air Force, they were together. And so that answers that question, I think. Yes. Yes. Uh, did the uh, RCAF Americans receive any veterans benefits from Canada? Um, I don't believe so. Now, right. there were some RCAF Americans decided after the war to emigrate or live in Canada, like big Joe McCarthy. He stayed in Canada in the Royal Canadian Air Force, and he ended up on uh, Lancasters on maritime patrol and Neptunes, you know, the big twin engine, Neptune? Yep. He was on those and retired in the Royal Canadian Air Force. But most of them did not get benefits from the United States or benefits from the Canadian government. They just, they did their service and their duty and then went home. And imagine doing, I know several Americans that did 50 or 60 bombing missions in the Royal Canadian Air Force, two tours, one after another, and they went home to their home states and everybody said, well, what did you do in the war? And, you know, it's amazing 
these stories have been lost, but we're trying to save some of them here at Bomber Command Museum of Canada. Yes, and, and that reminds me of, of something we talked about the other night, is that uh, being lost, there were, uh, I think you said about 60 or so um, uh, airmen who in the transition between going back to the Army Air Force or Army Air Corps from the Royal Canadian Air Force uh, were killed in action and, and just sort of were just forgotten until until you discovered their names. Right. Okay. So here's what happened is we're doing this master database and we've got the guys that flew in the Royal Canadian Air Force and they were killed and they or they got awards or whatever. Okay. Here's what happened is in that little tiny area where those 3,500 Americans transferred to the Army Air Force, those guys went down to London. They got their American uniforms, their American ID, and the American officials asked them, are you still flying a combat tour with your Canadian squadron? He'd say, yes, I'm halfway through my tour, combat tour. And the Americans said, okay, go back to your squadron and finish your tour and then report back to us. And we found these guys, they are truly, truly in the cracks of history because here's what happened is 50 or 60, I think we're up to 59 now, of these RCAF Americans that became Army Air Force, they were killed while trying to finish their tours. So this guy go, gets shot down in a Halifax or a Spitfire or whatever, wearing a United States Army Air Force uniform with American rank. And he wasn't, he wasn't on, he wasn't in the Royal Canadian Air Force or in the RAF. So he's in no man's land, he gets killed in action and we found 59 of them now that they aren't listed in the honor rolls of the Royal Canadian Air Force because they were Army Air Force when they were killed. And they get two or three words mentioned about them in the American records, like transferred to Army Air Force. And that's it. Here's these decorated veterans, the guys that have done scores of combat trips and they're not remembered in Canada and they're not remembered in the USA. And so there's, we found 59 guys. So guess what we're doing is we're putting those 59 names on our black granite wall. We've got extra, extra, uh, you know, sort of uh, panes, extra areas on our black granite wall. And we're putting those RCAF Americans names on our national memorial wall this summer. So that'll be a special ceremony later this summer. But uh, folks, anything you wanna ask, if you can get that digital copy of the Dispatch Magazine about the RCAF Americans, everything, all the websites, all the sources, all the things that you want to know that are online, get that article by the, the Dispatch magazine. It's got all of that reference material in it. Uh, one of our viewers uh, is asking, uh, Arlington Memorial Cemetery in, in Washington has a memorial to the Canadians who served in the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, and you mentioned the memorial wall that you have at your museum. Is there an official Canadian memorial to uh, the Americans who served? Okay, I would say if I had to use one word, no. Okay. But the RCAF Americans killed in action wearing RCAF uniforms, they're already engraved on our National Memorial Wall. So you can find these guys. I, I, I can take my master list and compare it to what's on the wall. I can find them. It's those 59 that kind of fell through the cracks of history. Uh, yes, we. I've seen the memorial at Arlington National Cemetery to the Canadians, and it goes, it starts in the First World War, it goes to the Second World War, it goes to Korea, it goes everywhere that the Americans fought, the Canadians fought. Everywhere that the Canadians fought, there was Americans in there. And so it's, it's 
it's dang close. It's this close. And we shouldn't think of it as separate sacrifice. It's, it's a corporate sacrifice. And these RCAF Americans, far as I'm concerned, they're our adopted sons. Well, now here's here's a question that's a little bit off topic, but uh, still relatable. Uh, one of our viewers would like to know uh, if you, Carl, were possibly flying tours around the uh, Canadian Arctic in 1990. He has a, a photo of a pilot or first officer in his tour book that uh, looks a whole lot like a younger Carl. Yeah, well, he'd have to be younger. No, um, I did my uh, flying in 1973-74 up in the high Arctic on Twin Otters. And uh, that was quite an adventure and I didn't get killed. So then I moved, moved on to the airlines. And uh, so, uh, but uh, no, I, I was a little bit before that and uh, uh, bless you for thinking that I would be flying up North in 1990. So, uh, but uh, uh, I hope that answers your question. I think it did. Uh, one of the other questions was uh, why the Canadians uh, flew at night, and that was that was just the uh, operationally the Americans uh, had, were committed to daylight bombing, and the the uh, Commonwealth forces were, were committed to uh, nighttime raids. That was just the way things worked out. Different philosophies in the in the uh, commands. Sure. Yeah. Uh, daylight. United States Army, Air Force, and RAF, but. It's kind of this period of before D-Day. It was mostly night for the RAF and daytime for the Americans. But then as we started pushing the Germans back, the Nazis get pushed back towards Germany, their air defenses are weakened. And then the night bombers could fly during the day to add extra punch to the American raids during daylight. So that, that dividing line is about D-Day, is a ton of flying in the day by the night bomber force after D-Day, but not that much before. Right. All right, we are uh, just a little uh, after the top of the hour, so uh, we've got our, our, our marching orders here, uh, congressional gold medal or bust, and uh, any, any final thoughts uh, tonight, Carl? Just uh, I, I thank uh, the uh, commemorative Air Force and uh, Leah Block and her team and uh, Steve, your EAA group. Uh, you've done so much for all these warbirds and, uh, uh, you know, but guess what? A World War II airplane without the airmen in them, it's an inanimate object. As soon as you put the airmen in there, now you've got something and it's called freedom. So, you know, I just, uh, I thanks for getting this message out. Uh, our message from Canada to the USA is let's find the will. Let's go get that congressional gold medal. I think 8,800 Americans deserve it. And uh, let's see what we can do. That sounds good. Uh, and again, the, uh, the, electronic version of the dispatch is, is already out online. Uh, you can, uh, like I said, Leah posted a, a link on Facebook. And uh, so you go ahead and read it or you can wait till it comes in, in the mailbox in physical form, depending on which uh, way you like to do it. But it is a very, very uh, interesting topic. And uh, if you are so moved, please uh, join us in, in contacting your congressional representatives and ask them to uh, support the bill to uh, to get the uh, RCAF Americans the uh, Congressional Gold Medal. And uh, uh, Carl, uh, just before we let you go, uh, we're going to try to do something with you again uh, at the end of June. Uh, tell us what, what you'll be doing the end of uh, the end of June this year. Yes, end of June, start of July, we found a Royal Canadian Air Force Halifax heavy bomber underwater in 40 feet of water. It did a ditching and uh, we've got a salvage crew, we've got a diving crew, and we'll be over in Sweden recovering this Halifax and bringing it back to the Bomber Command Museum of Canada. And uh, this is our ultimate tribute. And remember this folks, some swords of freedom are made out of aluminum. 
And Carl, we uh, wish you uh, wish you luck with that expedition, and and I hope we can get the technology to work so we can uh, maybe do a, a, a live program from uh, from your expedition and and give folks a, a firsthand look at uh, everything that's going on as you try to bring that Halifax uh, back to life. Great. Okay. Well, thanks again to all of you, the uh, commemorative Air Force and EAA, and uh, this is uh, what we got to do. This is the passion. That's right. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, if you uh, have a moment, please hit the like, subscribe, or follow button so we can let you know about future shows. As always, if you have any ideas for topics or people you'd like to hear from or airplanes you'd like to learn more about, just send Leah Block an email at media at cafhq.org. Thanks again to Carl for uh, shedding some light on this very little known part of World War II history. Pick up the dispatch, read it. Uh, I think you will thoroughly enjoy it. And until next time, for the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Bus. Have a great night.